Hello. I thought that standing ovation was for me, but uh, then I paid attention. <laughs> okay, a disease I love to hate, polio. It's an ancient disease, as you can tell from this Egyptian stella uh, from thousands of years ago. And this stella kind of depicts that probably there was polio-like paralysis, as you can note on the right lower limb. The problem is the disease is not only ancient, it's also very relevant and very recent, very current as we speak. So the photo that you see on the on the left hand side it was actually one that I took when I was working as a shoe leather epidemiologist in India. And you can see the striking similarity from the from that Egyptian stella of that lower limb deformity to the photo that I took. So polio is very relevant, very current. As I said, it is a designated public health emergency of international concern. So a lot of important aspects that we need to understand. And in a way, it is vaccinology on steroids when you, when you start learning about polio because the scale, the enormity, the complexity of, of a disease eradication program is very different from, let's say, a control program, which are all difficult, but the scales are very different over here. So think about immunization. And for polio eradication, it's not only an, a routine immunization center-based approach. We're always talking about adding on the house-to-house -house campaigns. Think about resource mobilization. It's billions of dollars, literally a billion dollar every year almost, when it comes to the, the amount of money spent on polio. And also think about the complexity. So we'll talk about some of those today in terms of geographies that we want to get into. So again, the scale is very, very different. I've ensured in the 25 minutes, I'm not talking about too many things. So I have selected kind of less than 25 content slides. But the idea is I'll talk about a little bit but you will talk more during the question and answer session. So I'm really expecting that the overall discussion will be complete once we discuss all the aspects of polio. So this is the plan for today. Let's start off with a quick poll because I will work less and you'll work more for this talk. So the first poll is this one and we'll do it the old fashioned way, which is also a bit of an exercise. So raise your hand if you think we have eradicated zero human diseases. How about one? Only one hand to be raised per person. All right. How about 1.67? I see a lot of laughter. We'll come back to that. I see one hand, one other tentative. I might have Seattle chocolates for the winner. How about two? Kamel, it could have been two if you have stayed with us in the polio eradication program. Now, there is always a none of the above. So, so everybody has to respond. I'm counting. So how about none of the above? Okay. All right. So what is disease eradication? This is one thing that I really want everybody will, will understand and not make a mistake when we are defining disease eradication. So there are many ways to define disease eradication. There are some controversies as well. The simplest way is to, is to define it this way. It, it is a permanent reduction of disease incidence to zero. And this permanent reduction has to be worldwide. So three components, permanent reduction to zero and global in nature. So never we should talk about, let's say, India eradicating polio or America's eradicating measles, it has to be a global stoppage of disease transmission or infection. So by that definition, smallpox is that one human disease that we have eradicated. But wait a minute, how about polio? So this is the, the, the polio virus spectrum for you. It's not only one disease in a way. It, it has multiple serotypes of the virus depending on whether it's naturally occurring or wild polioviruses or WPV, 
or the vaccine related poliovirus burden, also subclassified as vaccine associated paralytic polio or VAP or VDPVs or vaccine derived poliovirus. And each of these, sub, these types could be subdivided based on the serotype of polio, which are of three types, one, two, and three. So if you just focus on wild polioviruses, the naturally occurring polioviruses, we have already eradicated two out of the wild types that we had. So type two wild, type three wild are certified gone. Only one that remains is wild type one. So let's be very clear. So even that 1.67, one could argue is a smart answer, if not the right answer, right? Now, when it comes to VAP or VDP, yeah, you, I know you, you, you raised your hand there. All right. Now to the complexities of, of polio. So when it comes to the oral polio vaccine, it's an excellent vaccine, but in rare circumstances, it can induce either vaccine associated paralytic polio, which is an aberrant neuroparalytic reaction to the strains of OPV or something that is more important from a public health perspective, the, the phenomenon of VDPVs, vaccine-derived polioviruses. These are essentially revertent strains of the Sabin oral polio vaccine virus that over time has lost its attenuating mutations. So it can actually induce neurovirulence and cause paralysis it can also transmit from one person to the other. And, and particularly if you have established uh, evidence of transmission, we term them as circulating VDPVs or CVDPVs. The type two component of the Sabin OPV is the predominant type inducing such CVDPVs. So I hope the spectrum of polioviruses is clear uh, to all of you. So let's move on and, and look into the dramatic his, history when it comes to the polio eradication story. And this is only the past 20 years. In fact, this month, we are celebrating 35 years of the initiation of the WHO resolution to eradicate polio. Any idea how many cases were there when the eradication program started in 1988? thousand cases would have been reported when every day globally back when the eradication program started. So 350,000 overall annual burden, massive. To that, we were already down to roughly thousand cases every year in, in the past 20 years or so, starting from 2000, let's say. And it has gone up and down a little bit, but you can see the dramatic drop down, particularly from 2010 onwards, when India became polio free, Nigeria was, was soon to follow. So the big burden countries were becoming polio free, and that contributed to this dramatic drop in the wild polio virus incident. So everything in the bar diagrams are the wild poliovirus cases, either type 1 in the dark shades or type 3 in the lighter shades. Now, what is happening in here is very interesting. If you just focus on the past couple of years, three to four years, there is a bit of a reversal of trends. So one, there is, a, there is stagnation in terms of the overall progress. We are very close to zero, but not quite zero when it comes to wild polioviruses. And then there is this sharp increase in terms of the vaccine-derived polioviruses depicted with the line diagrams. The green uh, are the type 2 circulating vaccine-derived viruses. The other colors are type 1 and 3. So keep this issue in mind. One, the stagnation, the fact that we're not quite reaching zero, and it's, it's, it's there in, in a few geographies in, in terms of wild, and then the rise in circulating vaccine-derived polioviruses. These two issues really form the policies, the strategies of the eradication endgame as we speak. So let's zoom in as to what's happening on the wild poliovirus front. 
Essentially, there are only two countries that are still endemic for wild poliovirus type 1, Pakistan and Afghanistan. The point to be noted in here is are the nuances of these two countries. So even though these two countries have been endemic for quite some time, the, the reduction in genetic lineage of even wild type 1 is really encouraging. So if you look into the past couple of years, we now basically have one family of wild type virus type 1 in Afghanistan and one in Pakistan. Just to put things into context, it used to be 11 genetic lineages or families of wild type 1 even three years ago. So that's a very promising trend overall from a molecular epi perspective. This is exactly what we have seen in places like Nigeria and India. There would be many, many genetic lineages, and then it would come down just before the countries became polio-free. Now, you might ask, that's fine. It's, it's a good declining trend. But what's happening in these countries? Why we are not able to get to zero in these two specific geographies, and that too in a few specific districts, actually, of Pakistan and Afghanistan. This is a one-slide summary, a poignant one, but I use this, uh, you know, in, in my, my discussions. On right-hand side, you see a family, of Sakina Bibi, a 33-year-old old vaccinator, a free female frontline worker, who was killed during vaccination campaigns along with her child. So you might, must have heard about vaccine avoidance, vaccine mistrust, much like eradication complexities. This is taking the spectrum to another level. I call this vaccine violence. But these women vaccinators are still picking up the career and still going back to those communities. But keep in mind the level of, of the problem in some of these geographies. And then on the, on the left-hand side, of course, you're all aware of the disruption that Afghanistan went through as a country uh, with the regime change uh, and the massive displacement of population. So juxtapose such geopolitical situations with the kind of vaccination campaigns one has to conduct for a highly infectious virus like polio. Now, what's going on with the circulating VDPVs? Again, a unique situation. I've purposefully chosen just 2022, last year, for a snapshot of the, of the situation for CVDPV2. So black dots in the, in the blue countries here are the countries that have been experiencing CVDPV outbreaks, primarily in Africa. What is striking for, for last year was these orange colors on the map. So even high income settings like the UK, US, Canada, Israel, and then finally Indonesia, they all reported imported strains of circulating vaccine derived poliovirus. So quite a striking uh, phenomenon from an epidemiologic perspective. And again, depicts the fact that polio free doesn't mean polio risk free even for high-income countries, even for countries where the national coverage might, might be good, but there are still pockets of under-immunized children where viruses can pop up. Now, why this is happening? Why we are seeing CVDPVs rise? There are many reasons. I've chosen three for all of us. One, we have a trend of declining mucosal immunity against the type 2 virus because in 2016, there was a switch from trivalent OPV use in routine immunization to bivalent OPV use in routine immunization, withdrawing the type 2 component. We also had an insufficient supply of IPV, so we didn't quite ensure that all countries would have IPV coverage that could have prevented at least the paralytic burden. The third complexity, the conundrum here is the vaccine of choice that we had to respond to such type 2 vaccine-derived outbreaks, the Sabin OPV2 monovalent, itself seeded new outbreaks. Approximately 76 new emergences were seeded from the use, or should I say insufficient use, 
of the vaccine of MOPV2. So it's a complex situation. And what do we do in such a situation? So this is what we have been thinking about. So obviously we have the oral polio vaccine, OPV, and the IPV, the inactivated polio vaccine. I'm not getting into the details, and you are mostly aware of this. I will highlight the critical elements of these two vaccines that are still posing some complexities to the program. So with IPV, the major problem is poor primary intestinal immunogenicity. It doesn't quite stop person-to-person transmission in high-risk settings. With OPV, the one major problem we already talked about is this issue of VAP and VDPVs. Again, rare, but real. So we need an ideal vaccine, and I have I've listed the attributes of the ideal vaccine, but these are the two primary parameters, not having the same risk of VAP and VDPV, and still having intestinal mucosal immunogenicity. Now, let's see what we got. So scientists all over the, from all, all over the world, partners of GPI, came together back in 2011, 2012, to develop what we call the novel oral polio vaccine type 2. Much like you change your iPhones or Androids these days, this is a next-gen vaccine of the existing Sabin vaccine. So we used the Sabin structural genome and we just tweaked or genetically modified a couple of important areas. And this is based out of knowledge of evolutionary genetics that was available by then. So we moved what we call a cis-replicating element, CRE, from the non-structural area to the, the structural area or five prime end. This is this kind of acts as a barrier to further mutations within the, the, the capsid and within the overall protein of the vaccine. Then the primary change was in what we call domain five, which is typically the area where reversions lead to a cascading set of new reversions. And this domain five was fixed with, with specific nucleotide substitutions. And finally, there were also changes made made at the polymerase level. All this to say that these changes introduced genetic stability to the existing Sabin OPV. And this was this was demonstrated through a series of fascinating cl- clinical trials. So I'll highlight again where the changes were made. And I will note that by this time, we have completed several phase one through phase three studies with this new vaccine, and they're all published uh, in the Lancet and other other series of journals. The point is, it has established non-inferior immunogenicity compared to Sabin OPV2 and superior genetic stability compared, again, to Sabin OPV2. Okay, second poll, just so you're not sleeping yet. What is that vaccine that got the EUL first ever? Very difficult guess, right? Okay, let's try. Pfizer, raise your hand. Okay. Moderna. NOPV2. AstraZeneca, none of the above. <laughs> well, it can't be that. Well, well, this one is easier, of course. Come on, guys. It's me presenting this. It has to be NOPV2. So it was NOPV2 back in November 2020. That was the, the first ever vaccine to be authorized under emergency use listing. It in a way paved the way for the same pathway to be used for COVID-19 vaccines. And by now, believe it or not, it's been two years of use of NOPV2. 600 million doses of this vaccine have been administered in 28 countries uh, across the world, wherever we are seeing the type 2 CVDPV outbreaks. It's quite an amazing feat in terms of real-world application of innovation that, that happened in the past several years. Now, is it working? Is it doing the job? Now, again, remember this point that NOPV2 has a lower risk 
of reverting to, to problematic virulent uh, strains, but it's not a no-risk vaccine. So what we are seeing in here is quite promising and amazing. This graph depicts how much of different types of OPV we have used. In orange uh, are, are the numbers for NOPV2. In the line diagrams, you see how many new emergence of CVDPVs that are there. That is uh, in, in orange again. In blue line, you see how many uh, new outbreaks or new countries reporting CVDPV outbreaks. So there is clearly a pre-NOPV2 era for polio and a post-NOPV2 era. You can see the numbers of new countries reporting outbreaks coming down. The numbers of new emergences have also come down pretty dramatically. But please note again, it's not just the vaccine. It's how you vaccinate. It, and it applies to Sabin OPV2, which in itself is a great vaccine, and to NOPV2. And even with NOPV2, as I said, in particularly areas of poor immunization, persistently poor immunization, and high NPV rates, non-polio enterovirus rates, even NOPV2 can revert to generate CVDPVs. And although the rates are much, much lower, so we, only pick, we have only picked up two so far across the 600 million doses and 28 countries, but it is still there. So please note that it's not a magic bullet. We still have to vaccinate and vaccinate properly, but it's an extremely promising trend overall. As the world has moved more and more towards NOPV2, the number of outbreaks, both countries and number of emergencies have gone down. So finally, how do we move out of any OPV use? What's the plan for the end game of polio? So this is what the SAGE has recommended recently when it comes to transition from IPV only in routine immunization to, so, sorry, from bivalent OPV in routine immunization to IPV only in routine immunization, particularly keeping in mind the post eradication phase. And there are four criteria that are being emphasized by SAGE. One, to have adequate population immunity before we switch again or before we stop all OPV use in routine. Adequate surveillance, including surveillance for immune defic deficient vaccine derived poliovirus shedders, no evidence of persistent CVDPV1 or CVDPV3 circulation, and finally, a sufficient supply of IPV so that at countries can administer at least two doses of the vaccine of IPV. These are the four criteria, and these are being updated as well based on the epidemiology. But this is how we move to all IPV eventually. And this are, these are the existing recommendations for number of doses. So either a primary series of three doses, 246 or 6104 or equivalent, and then a booster, or a delayed two dose, which is essentially starting at 14 weeks or equivalent and giving another dose at nine months or equivalent. And there are studies that have confirmed that with delayed dose like this one at 14 weeks and nine months, you still get equivalent seroconversion compared to earlier three dose administration of IPV, be it full dose or fractional dose IPV. So my final slide here is, is, a, is a look into the future and just to give you a glimpse of how much of research and development activities are still going on as we enter and pass through the end game of polio. So a bunch of novel OPV development initiatives are in place. So NOPV2 we already have. We are working on NOPV1 and 3 for outbreak response. A bunch of in investments on routine immunization-based vaccines, so primarily IPV and its modification, more focusing on safer production of IPV. So a lot of interest these days on virus-like particles for polio vaccine production. And finally, therapeutics, so, so antivirals or monoclonal antibodies to stop 
the chronic shedders of polioviruses like the, uh, the ones with primary immunodeficiency di disorder patients so that the community is not, not exposed to polioviruses. But having discussed all of this, I, if there is one take home from, from this lecture, I would like to be this one. We have talked about OPV, IPV, and NOPV2 and how good these vaccines really are. But vaccines sitting in a vial will not do the job. We still have to focus on vaccinating. And as vaccinologists, even if you're working in a lab and developing a new molecule, think about that real world use all the time. Think about how affordable your vaccine will be. Will the real world countries, th those who are facing the outbreaks, will be able to deliver the vaccination activities? And I keep saying that if there would be any global health Olympics ever, polio vaccinators will bring back some medals. So from these bungee jumping champions to the swimming and the weightlifting champion in the real world, to the women vaccinators leading from the front, no matter how violent some of the situations are. And despite the pandemic, the polio workers continue to play a big, big role in the fight uh, against stopping this disease. There are still several uncertainties where I, I would like to really hear from you all. Should we look into genetic markers of transmissibility? Can we actually complete the interruption of CVDPVs? How exactly IPV can be used in outbreak response? They're all open questions and I would welcome your participation over here. But the bottom line remains, we are failing to vaccinate. And that's the issue and not really the vaccine choices and, uh, you know, the issues around number of doses, etc. So we need to intensify vaccination efforts. We need to ensure OPV cessation is well planned, backed up with adequate supply of IPV and potentially NOPVs for outbreak response. We need to strengthen essential immunization and surveillance and finally prepare for containment activities. So with that, I'll thank my team, uh, both a global team and also a team at the foundation. If you're still paying attention, you can see who's watching us from that monitor over there. No pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Arendra. Thank you. So we have time for question and I'll start with Wahid. Uh, thank you, sir. Wahid from Pakistan. As you mentioned that uh, countries with, uh, having polio virus endemic areas, they are using B BOPV now. So what are the strategies to use both NOPV and BOPV? My second question is regarding the IPV use in endemic countries. Either they should use fractional dose or full dose. And the third question is regarding the zero surveillance. So when that can be done? Thank you. Wow, Wahid, and thank you for your own work in Pakistan in difficult circumstances. So BOPV and NOPV2, again, please note NOPV2 is not meant to be a routine immunization vaccine. It's an outbreak response vaccine. So we don't envision to use NOPV2 in routine immunization unless the epidemiology dramatically changes. We did a recent clinical trial in Bangladesh to evaluate the co-administration of BOPV and NOPV2, not in routine, but in outbreak response setting, because it's relevant for a country, let's say like DRC, which is experiencing type 1 CVDPVs and, and type 2 CVDPVs. Unfortunately, the clinical trial, which is just published in the Lancet ID, demonstrated that there is a significant immunologic interference onto the type 2 response if the two vaccines are given together. So currently, even for outbreak response, we don't plan to give these vaccines together. So to your point also about zero surveillance, you know, it keeps happening in some of the key geographies. We do have uh, want to do additional zero surveys in Pakistan as well. However, there is always a time lag, you know, with the conduct of zero surveillance, you know, coming in of the results and then impacting policy. So we really have to be sure if the zero surveillance results will be meaningful for policy making and will be time relevant or not. What was your second question? Sorry, I forgot. Uh, IPV full dose or yeah. fractional dose? Yeah. So we have established equivalence 
of full dose and fractional dose IPV if, number one, the one dose is given late enough in the overall infancy. So 14 weeks and later, it doesn't look like that the two different doses are any different. However, if, if the dose, if the first dose is given earlier than 14 weeks due to the interference with maternally derived antibodies, it's typically recommended you give two doses of fractional IPV uh, compared to one dose of full dose. Beyond two doses, it seems like both are equivalent. So two or more doses, if we can give, there is not much of a difference in terms of seroresponses. With full dose IM, IPV, you see a much higher, tighter, absolute titers uh, of, of, of the polioviruses in general. Let's start from the back, Matthias. To follow on, on what you said before, why can't we use an OPV2 in routine immunization? Great question, because again, it is a lower risk vaccine, but not a no risk vaccine. And what we were trying to do is to essentially respond to the specific outbreaks and stop them. Compared to supply to the world, you know, a type 2 vaccine yet again, a type 2 OPV. Again, no matter how low the risk is, we can't rule out some amount of seeding from even NOPV2. So it's better compared to going back to a type 2 OPV in, uh, in RI, in routine immunization, that we save it for outbreak response. And for routine immunization, type 2 protection can still come from IPV if the countries are implementing the two-dose sca SAGE schedule. So let's go, Esther. Thank you for the excellent presentation. My first question is, do we have a CVDPV from type 3 wild poliovirus? So great point. So yes, we do have seen CVDPVs from, from type 3, but the rate uh, of such incidents is much, much lower. You know, overall, CVDPVs are phenomenon that we're only detecting for the past 23 years or so. So it's essentially started from the year 2000. And if you look into this overall 23-year period, type 2 by far predominates the picture. There are sporadic outbreaks of type 1 CVDPV, like the one we are seeing as we speak now in DRC in Madagascar, and a few incidents of type 3 CVDPV. So it's, you know, it is real. Type 3 CVDPVs can happen, but it seems like the type 3 component is inherently very weak, uh, in terms of the Sabin uh, strains, and it doesn't quite lead to transmission, uh, you know, ma like the type 1 and type 2. So, yes, it can happen, but much, much lower in terms of the overall risk. I saw a hand on the back. I just want to make a comment on yeah. IPV stability in the field. IPV has a very weak stability in terms of thermostability and experience from the field working in sub-Saharan places. It changes the VVM very fast. So as you think of the polio endgame of switching to IPV, think about making a more stable vaccine. Thank you. Excellent point. Let's let's work together on that. Yeah. Thanks. I saw a hand on the back. Okay. Go ahead. Hello. Um, Kim from the Philippines. So we're also starting to um, uh, turn from BOPV to IPV. So currently our schedule right now is three BOPV and two full IPV. So one of the slides you showed earlier was on the criteria from fully shifting to IPV. And my question is, how how do you quantify the adequate uh, immunity, uh, population immunity on BOPV? Yeah. That's a great question, Kim. It hasn't been really clearly defined in terms of the level or threshold of population immunity. It's more indirect evidence that the country typically would have to assess. So, so really it is evidence of how much of circulation you're seeing. If you're seeing too much of vaccine viruses being shed in the communities and then your overall immunization coverage assessment, both the assessment of the supplementary immunization campaigns and also assessment of your RI coverage. So these things together give you a sense of the population immunity. There is no one benchmark, unfortunately. 
uh, it was a wonderful uh, talk. My question is how countries are being supported uh, in accessing NOPV2 vaccine quickly if they want to do it. That's a great question. So it the, the countries have to go through a very specific process. We call it the readiness verification process under EUL, emergency use listing. So essentially a country has to ensure that surveillance is working in the country. It has ability to distribute vaccines and it has ability to detect any safety incidents. So there is a list of criteria that a country has to satisfy to be readiness verified for NOPV to use. And we are encouraging from a global standpoint that all countries at risk, no matter if the countries have a CVDPV outbreak or not, they should all try to be readiness verified. And once that is that is done, once a country establishes readiness for use of NOPV2, then it's essentially a release from the stockpile if the, the WHO or the GPI authorizes use of the vaccine in the country. So it goes through those, those steps, readiness verification, then clearance from the global group that the country needs to respond to an outbreak, and then the director general releases the vaccine if there is supply. So it's very unique uh, compared to other vaccines, licensed and pre-qualified vaccines. So may I ask one question then in addition of that? One question, if I may ask. I have another question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, that was so, probably the question I was going to ask. Go ahead. So uh, what is the status of India? Status of India is a very philosophical question uh, no, about what? Was... No, uh, it was in following uh, follow-up of what I asked regarding accessing NOPV2. What is the status of India? I think there is uh, some constraint with NRAs. Absolutely. So I was pulling your legs. Of no, course, it's fine. India. I have to. That's fine. But so it's a very important question. India is still under discussion with the NOPV working group, which I happen to co-lead along with uh, you know my colleague at WHO. It has not really completed the readiness verification process. I would encourage everyone from India going back, try to encourage the country to complete the process. It has started discussions. It is it it understands the risks, but it's still not verified for use. And again, please note, being readiness verified doesn't mean the country has to use the vaccine. It is just being prepared. If there is an importation, then the country can immediately use it if there is supply. And Kamel can't ask questions. He left the Gates Foundation. He left polio eradication. And look where we are. He should be answering questions. You're in better place than when I left. No, my question was following that. But this, this readiness is linked to the fact that the vaccine is used in EUL. Correct. So the vaccine will at one point become pre-qualified. So my question is, where are we with that? Great question. March 29th this year was the date we submitted. Biopharma, the supplier of this vaccine, submitted the pre-qualification dossier to WHOPQ and also to the Indonesian regulatory authority. So the clock has started for the PQ evaluation to move from EUL status to PQ and license status. The estimated timelines are the end of this year. We are hoping by Q4 or so, NOPV2 will be pre-qualified. Thank you. Yeah. And then I'll move the other side. Okay. Thank you for the great presentation. So my question is uh, regarding the end game. You mentioned, talked about um, supplementary immunization, uh, but as well, the, risk, the routine immunization supporting program. Um, the question is about cost effectiveness. How is uh, the risk program cost effective compared to the supplementary immunization activities? That's the campaigns. For the GPI, uh, um, partners as well as the, the government? That's an excellent question. So clearly the campaigns or the supplementary immunization activities are very expensive. They took a, they take a lot of money and a lot of engagement across the board. But the purpose of the supplementary immunization campaigns, particularly for outbreak response, is very different, as you can imagine. We are talking about a virus which is highly infectious. The R0 of polio can be anywhere between 5 to 15. So kind of matches in certain settings 
the infectiousness of measles. So if you see a virus of interest, you have to respond with a vaccine that works with the, the, the known vaccination efforts. So in terms of the cost effectiveness, of course, more expensive when it comes to SIAs. Routine immunization is built on an existing system, so not much of an added cost other than the strengthening activities. The point is what you get out of it in, a, in different settings. If there is ongoing outbreak or risk of ongoing outbreaks, there is no option really other than to conduct the outbreak response campaigns over and above routine immunization. So we're running out of time. I'll take only two questions. Please be quick, Raoul and then Santosh. Thank you, Raoul from uh, DR Congo. So, uh, my question, my first question, the rapid question is just uh, the use uh, of NOPV and uh, BOPV. How long could be the cessation of one to, okay. to, to use the other? That's my first question. The second one is for African country, we know that uh, the CVDPV are most located in Africa. So many of the uh, African country are using the OPV first and IPV after. But in Latin America, they are using IPV first and OPV then. Is there any comparison that should be done to move forward to change this in Africa? Because I think that we are missing something in Africa that we have a lot of cases of the CVDPV as well as type 1 and type 2. Oh. Raul, I'm glad you asked those questions. This is, a, this is a very important concept, and let me clarify. So first of all, in terms of the gap between BOPV and NOPV2, the current recommendation is four weeks or more. So if there is a BOPV campaign happening in a, in a particular geography, the NOPV2 campaign has to wait for four weeks. It doesn't apply to routine immunization, though. A, a child who has received bivalent OPV in routine immunization can have NOPV2 at any point of time. It's only that mass administration that is segregated by four weeks as of now. Your second point question is a very important one. Whether or not giving IPV first, like some of the PAHO or, or, or the Latin and South American countries, would prevent VDPVs? The answer is likely no. What IPV first does prevent is the phenomenon of VAP mostly in, in, in the settings that we're talking about. So you might expect less paralysis if, if IPV is given first. The generation of VDPVs is to do with two functions primarily. One, the inherent instability of the OPV. And second, whether or not there is mucosal, gut mucosal immunity, because that impacts at the amount of replication of a live virus. So giving IPV first will not really change much the intestinal mucosal immunogenicity of a particular individual. So VDPVs, no. VAP, yes. IPV should protect if given first. Santosh, very quickly, please. Yeah, thanks for the very interesting talk. Maybe just a question on NOPV2. You mentioned there's already a few cases of VDPV, right, with NOPV2. Uh, so if you see an increasing trend of like this reverting that's happening in NOPV2, yep. is there a vision of the leadership to move to the next generation of vaccines? Yeah? Great point. And something that we're dealing almost every day with when we look at the data. So, so first of all, we do expect some CVDPV cases, some VAP cases, as unfortunate as they are, with the use of live OPV, no matter what live OPV we're talking about. To, to your very important point, to put things into context, if we had used Sabin OPV2 in this scale, which if you recall was 600 million doses already, in these difficult geographies, 28 countries, we would have probably seen in this two-year period about 40, 30 to 40 uh, new CVDPV emergences. We would have detected, we would have seeded probably 60 in only a subset of those 60 seeded would have been seen by now. So that's the scale of the difference that we are talking about. Of course, to your hypothetical point, if it comes closer and closer to the CBIN risk, 
then obviously it's a it's a huge problem and complexity for the program. I do not think we have the appetite and the bandwidth to develop yet another next generation vaccine at this level of the program. I will take this opportunity to reiterate though that VDPVs, although we call them vaccine-derived polioviruses, to me, these are low vaccination-derived polioviruses. Vaccine, vaccine doesn't quite induce VDPVs at a community level. It only turns into VDPVs if there is persistently poor immunization coverage. Please note that conundrum. So as long as we can vaccinate, we can stop VDPVs. And with an NOPV2, there is higher chances of stopping it.